Dear friends, welcome to yet another installment of Orbital Geek. In this video, we reveal the mysteries behind NASA's Artemis missions and explore the hidden challenges that may hinder humanity's return to the moon. Discover how the promises of lunar landings are filled with uncertainties and how SpaceX plans to make history with the ambitious Starship rocket. Will current technology and plans be enough to overcome the enormous obstacles? Or are we facing an impossible task? Watch until the end to uncover the truth and join our debate. Will NASA really succeed in landing on the moon again? Leave your comment below and subscribe to the channel. We're going to the moon this decade, that's what NASA keeps claiming, and that's exactly what they want us to believe. After all, NASA wouldn't lie to us, right? There don't seem to be any potentially big problems with the Artemis missions to the moon that they're just not telling us about. Your like and comment are extremely important to us. They help the algorithm recommend our video to more people, which is essential for the growth of our channel, especially now that we're just starting out. If you can, leave a comment, even if it's just a simple hello. Your participation makes all the difference. So here's the situation. We started to notice some trends in the way big players like NASA and SpaceX present their ideas to the public. There's always a very clear and incredible goal that makes for a great headline. Setting foot on the moon, flying a drone on Titan, building a city on Mars, something that really sparks the imagination in a special way that I think only space exploration can achieve. That's the incredible part. But when it comes to how they plan to actually accomplish those incredible feats of science and engineering, we're lucky if we get a 30-second animation showing a spacecraft flying from point A to point B, and then something cool happening at the end. That might be enough for the average person, because it's probably all the information they'll be able to process, or frankly, all they're interested in knowing. For those of us with an above-average level of interest in the topic who want to ask questions and know details, that's typically where the flow of information starts to dry up, which is frustrating because we know what the goal is and we know why it's being done, but it's the how that we're really fascinated by. We want to know how things work. And the crazy thing is, most of the time, even the people in charge of the ambitious space endeavor have no idea how it's actually going to work. And this isn't from a lack of information, it's simply because very often the logistics for actually pulling off a major space mission haven't been fully worked out yet. And that's okay. I have infinite faith that someone way smarter than me will eventually figure out a solution to pretty much any problem. But today, just for fun, we want to talk about some of the bigger plot holes in NASA's most ambitious endeavor to date, the Artemis moon landing. Well, the first thing NASA wouldn't tell you is that they weren't really planning any more moon landings and had no intention of doing it again. That was the status quo until Donald Trump and Mike Pence came in and had a JFK moment, deciding that the moon landing became a top national priority and they set a tight deadline for NASA, 2024. Because what's the point of landing on the moon if it's not while Donald Trump is still president? I guess that was the thinking at the time. And through a genuinely weird series of events, even a considerably delayed moon landing could still happen while Donald Trump is president. Anyway, with an arbitrary timeline set by the election cycle, NASA engineers went back to the drawing board, desperately trying to cobble together a plan that could offer at least some hope of making it to the moon by 2024. What they ended up creating was a recycled design concept from the Bush Jr. era, combined with flight-proven hardware from the Reagan era, and thus the SLS was born. They took the design to President Trump and he said, yeah, looks like a rocket, approved. I don't know if that's exactly what he said, but I imagine Trump was drawn to the orange color of the SLS. Either way, what NASA may or may not have told the president at that point was that the SLS actually couldn't land on the moon. It could barely get a spacecraft into lunar orbit. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the SLS was the best that anyone at NASA could come up with the available resources at that time. So when it came to deciding how people would actually land on the moon and get back, they left it to someone else to figure out. I think in NASA's mind, they know that if they can at least show everyone that they managed to launch people into space on a big rocket and then bring them back to Earth alive, everyone will say NASA did a pretty good job. So to solve the giant plot hole in their moon landing plan, NASA put a big bounty on the table for any private company willing and able to build a lunar lander vehicle. In this case, the money was secondary. It was the prestige of being the company that landed people on the moon that was the real prize. And who loves to boast more than incredibly wealthy multi-billionaire CEOs? The contest came down to three main competitors. We had the underdogs, Dynetics, 
with a very practical lunar lander concept that was almost immediately dismissed. And the heavyweights, Blue Origin, with their silly and underdeveloped blue ball, Lunar Lander, versus SpaceX, with their very impressive but also underdeveloped Starship. So NASA awarded the win to SpaceX and their plan to land the biggest freaking rocket ever conceived on the moon. I guess when NASA asked SpaceX exactly how they plan to pull off something so utterly unprecedented, SpaceX said something like, we'll figure it out. Now, there are many fascinating things about SpaceX's Starship, but probably the hardest one to wrap your head around, and the one that you really don't hear about very often, is that the Starship is simultaneously the most capable rocket ever made and the most efficient. What we mean by that is that anytime SpaceX talks about the Starship's capabilities, they usually have to put a big asterisk next to the most impressive stats, like the Starship can haul 100 metric tons to the Moon or Mars with orbital refueling. The Starship can easily move 100 metric tons to low Earth orbit. And then, if it manages to link up with an orbital fuel depot and retank with cryogenic propellant, then in theory it could go pretty much anywhere. Again, I imagine at some point NASA must have asked SpaceX about the whole cryogenic orbital refueling thing, since nobody has ever even attempted that before, and I think SpaceX probably said something like, we'll figure it out. Admittedly, when I first heard about the refueling thing, I assumed you just needed to launch a second ship that would meet up with the first one, top up the fuel tanks, and you're good to go. But that's not the case. The Starship doesn't need a top up in low Earth orbit, it needs a full retanking. Those tanks are bone dry at this point, and to quench the thirst of the world's biggest rocket you need around 1,000 metric tons of propellant hauled up to low Earth orbit. So let's do some simple math here. If each Starship can haul 100 tons to orbit, and we need 1,000 tons, that's 10 Starships plus the tanker station ship, on top of the one that actually needs to go to the moon, so 12 Starships. What SpaceX isn't telling you is that the Starship can haul 100 metric tons to the moon if you first launch 11 more Starships. Oh, and what they also don't explain is that the methane and oxygen propellants need to be kept super cold in order to remain in a usable liquid state. And despite what you may have heard, it can actually get pretty darn hot in space, meaning a certain percentage of all that propellant we launch to orbit is just going to boil off and turn into useless gas that just gets vented into space. So you might actually need more like 14 or 15 Starship launches just to enable a single moon landing. And SpaceX has to do it twice because they need a practice run to demonstrate they can actually land without crashing so more like 30 starships for a single Artemis landing, if the first demo ship doesn't crash. Except the other thing SpaceX doesn't want to tell you is that their current version of Starship, which again is by far the biggest and most powerful rocket ever launched, can really only move about 50 metric tons to orbit, max. So to get the advertised payload capacity, we need to wait for Starship V2, which you guessed it, is an even bigger and more powerful rocket. Of course they haven't built Starship V2 yet, they haven't even figured out how to get the V1 to fly in a straight line, which needs to be solved before we can even think about having these things line up and dock outside of space. Oh, and the only way this whole shebang becomes remotely feasible is making the Starship land back on Earth after returning from space so it can be reused in about a day's turnaround. And I'm not saying the people at SpaceX, who are way smarter than me, can't figure out how to do that. I'm just pointing out they haven't actually done it yet, despite what you may have heard. Okay. Let's imagine all of this absurdly complicated rocket rigmarole we've just been talking about. Things that are only theoretically possible and haven't actually been done in real life yet. Let's say all of this gets figured out and happens in the next couple of years. Because NASA is literally still saying Artemis 3 will launch in 2026. So unless they're not telling us something, like the whole mission architecture, especially Starship, is way behind schedule, then I guess we just have to go with that. So our brave four astronauts depart aboard NASA's SLS, headed for the moon. Well, almost. The crew module will enter a rather peculiar orbit around the moon, called a near rectilinear halo orbit. Instead of circling around the moon as usual, this orbit does a kind of elongated oval motion, coming as close as the moon every six days. NASA will say they chose this to improve communication between the crew and Earth, which is true. But what they don't mention is that the SLS doesn't have enough oomph to put the crew module into a lower orbit. The closer you get to the moon, the more energy is needed to get back out, 
and there just isn't enough fuel on board for that. So it's in that super elongated empty space orbit that the crew will meet up with their starship Lunar Lander. Only two of the four astronauts will actually get to land on the moon. The other two will spend a whole week just floating around in a metal box. I'm sure they'll be fine. Now the starship needs to do a deceleration burn to descend down to the lunar surface. This is where we'll find out if it's possible to light off a cryogenic rocket engine that's been just floating around in space for days or weeks. This is another one of those things that's never been done before. Normally to fire an engine in space, we use a pressure-fed hypergolic design that uses propellant that auto-ignites. It's the simplest and safest method, but SpaceX's Raptor engine onboard Starship is a very complex dual turbo pump system, so there's a possibility it could be tricky to light it up in the vacuum of space, but they'll figure out a way. Here's the issue with that convoluted orbit they're in. If something goes wrong during the landing procedure and they need to abort, they won't get another chance at the moon for six days. Same goes for trying to get back up, which would be even worse. This eccentric orbit only offers a tiny window for critical operations that simply cannot fail in any way. You could almost call this a bit risky, but NASA won't, so it must be fine. Now our starship is en route to the lunar surface. It's landing time. How will we do it? Well, not us as people. The ship will have to land autonomously, which is quite risky. During the Apollo era, NASA built a simulation rig so the astronauts could practice manually flying the lunar lander. It wasn't a computer simulation, but an actual flying machine with a jet engine. Neil Armstrong did have a scare on that practice rig, but it was a valuable opportunity for them to learn the manual controls. That ensured that even if the guidance computer failed, there was still a good chance of landing safely. And many times the guidance computer did fail, but all the pilots successfully landed regardless. In the modern era, we have the Starship rocket, which is very tall and relatively slender, completely unlike any flying machine ever created before. It cannot be manually piloted, it's just not viable. The pilot would be at quite a height, with no visibility to see the base of the rocket. And it's not like modern computers are infallible at landing either. We've seen plenty of failures in recent years across space agencies like India, Japan and Russia. The intuitive machine's landing is a prime example of what can happen with a tall, slender vehicle that doesn't have a nice, stable landing. It tips over. And even with extremely smart people at intuitive machines, they couldn't prevent that from happening. Plus, we still haven't seen a proper landing gear design for SpaceX's Starship. They're considering catching the rocket with a giant launch tower, something that's never been done before and sounds insane. But they'll have to get serious about landing legs soon enough, which need to be robust and stable. What if the ship lands on uneven terrain? A powerful auto-leveling system will be needed to avoid an obvious disaster. And once they do manage to land safely on the lunar surface, our astronauts will only need to descend about 50 feet in an elevator to get to the actual surface. That should be smooth sailing. After all, we've never operated an elevator on the moon before. And we haven't even started to talk about dust. But that's a story for another time. Now to be clear, I'm not here critiquing any of this. I'm just acknowledging my own shortcomings in the face of these seemingly impossible challenges for my humble mind. And it's only when we admit this that we can truly appreciate the incredible brilliance of those working at NASA and SpaceX tackling these challenges on a daily basis. The faith I have in their ability is unwavering. In summary, NASA's Artemis mission is a fascinating blend of ambition and uncertainty. From a scientific standpoint, it's a true showcase of engineering and innovation, but it also presents a series of logistical and technological hurdles to overcome. SpaceX, with their colossal starship, promises to revolutionize space exploration, but many of its capabilities remain theoretical and unproven. We are relying on human ingenuity to solve intricate problems on a breakneck timeline. Do these monumental missions represent a bold leap in science or a politically driven race against time fueled by egos? Share your thoughts in the comments. Do you think NASA and SpaceX will succeed in landing on the moon again within the deadline? Subscribe to the channel and join the discussion.